Thank you for joining us on our journey here to preserve the history of mixed martial arts. When I wanted to take on this project, I needed help. I brought in one of my favorite matchmakers, Miguel Iterate, and the MMA detective, Mike Davis. So to do this, we've been able to preserve history. Welcome and enjoy. Hey, Miguel Iterate here for the Lights Out Podcast. Chris Lytle has us on us. I'm with the MMA detective, Mike Davis, and we are once again in legendary territory. Early UFC veteran Greg the Ranger Stott has joined us. Mike, welcome, welcome, Ranger Stott. Mr. Stott, how are you? I'm doing well. Better than I deserve, brother. Thanks for having me. Okay. So the thing about that, I there's not a lot out there about you, but the little research I found was you started life weightlifting and then you got into, I think, pro wrestling. Am I correct? No. But that's all right. We're going to take correct it. this record. I started life. I was born like you, but then <laughs> shit, I freaking had a mother that wanted to go ahead and test me so that after she divorced my dad, you know, when we talk about people and abusive situations, my mom had a new handle on it. What she did was she remarried and she married a pretty tough dude. So I'm nine kicks my ass for a few years, 12. I beat him down. She divorces him. She gets a tougher guy. The next guy comes in. We roll for a couple years. Boom. Knock him down. Then she goes for the ringer. This guy that's friggin' like banned in New Jersey. His name was Chuck Crosby. The reason I'm going to say his name, he's fucking dead. So it doesn't really matter. The point is Chuck comes in. I'm 16. And we're talking about a dude that like if they put his name, like all red lights go out, skull and crossbone, Al Capone plus. He's the shit. 17 bullet wounds, stab wounds, nose busted. When he met, this is coming right out of the book that'll be out in the fourth quarter. I'll be talking about this. He's actually got his own chapter. When he meets my brothers and I to start off, because you see how we can't just jump too fast. You're getting into violence right then. He sits at a round table. If you can imagine, I got two brothers from two years apart. I'm the oldest. I'm sitting there. He comes into the picture at around 14 years old. So we got a 12 and a 10 year old sitting at a round table. I know you can't imagine this in today's time. It can't ever happen. They'd freaking just, you know, they'd have to have a special prison to put people in like this. But we're sitting at the round table. Chuck, if you could imagine, the shaved head, no hair. Cigar, one corner of the mouth, pipe interacting in the other side of the mouth, chew, and a big pot of coffee sitting on the table. The next thing that happens is he looks at my brothers as we're sitting around the round table and he takes this handmade wicked craft thing, wood handle, leather strap studs, and he slaps it down on the table and he says, I don't think we're going to have any problem, are we, boys? So when you start off that way, and then my first big fight that got me out of the home, as far as knockdown, drag out, no holds bar for real, that was at 16. I'm on my own at 16. I'm going to high school back in New Jersey. This is in the 70s. I'm on split sessions. That means there's so many freaking people. You have to go morning and afternoon. All of a sudden, I'm working as a buggy lugger mason from 6 to 12, 12 to 6 going to school and football from 6 to 9. I'm in the service at 17 because I'm going, this shit really sucks. 17, I'm in the service. So this is where I was kind of capping when we were doing a little rough review let me just get you to speed i'm jumping years so we can get no, to it's okay. yeah. but at 21 let me this is what i do with my when i get young guys and i get guys and gals that come here to buy cars right and this new generation i mean forget about it but the point is when we get these young ones you know they gotta ask their mother for everything they can't even sign their name i gotta run classes people they don't even teach people how to sign now on contracts so you got these young people here and i go how old are you if somebody hits me with them 21 or under or 22 here's the line i'll give it to you when i was 21 two one i'm an airborne ranger already jumped into combat married three years and i got a kid so i'm a sergeant airborne ranger combat veteran three years married with a kid that's my 21 so where do you want to go right that's me at 21 yeah. Okay, so it's not, hey, you lifted weights. That sounds like somebody out of California. You had a protein shake, you lifted weights, and hey, life was good, and where'd you want to go? I just brought you up to speed. 
Okay. So I'm 21 in the service, and I'm basically, uh, you know, high speed, low drag, Teflon coated, crazy son of a bitch, doing everything, Airborne Ranger, Pathfinder, the whole deal. How many years did you serve in the military? Nine. Okay, and your military career did you did you serve in war? Yeah, I was in. Well, I jumped in a grenade. We did the Grenada in '83, okay. and then I was an advisor and did things in Central America. Okay, okay. They didn't call so, it war till '93. What time? What year? How old were you when you got out of the military? Twenty-seven. And how would you describe your military career? It was great until, you know, I mean, I, I was a hard charging guy that was a bipolar. You want to, I'll give you a sound bite. This is again, all stuff that'll be shown in movies and books and stuff that we got. We've already signed deals that things will be coming out, but this tells the story. Here's the caption. When I tell this story, how was your military career? You ready? Here it is. We can walk you through it in a couple sound bites. I'm sitting here and uh, I'm doing all the stuff, you know, Joey airborne ranger, high speed, low drag. Everything's looking cool. So I decide, why not? I'll be the youngest guy to ever make Delta Force. So I try out. So I'm at selection for what they call the unit, Delta Force. These are called CSSP. I mean, these, they had all sorts of names for it. But now, you know, everybody kind of talks a little Delta Force. So anyway, this is back when it first started, because you're talking, I'm trying out in 85. The unit didn't really come even into existence until 80. You follow? So it's in its newness. Like Cadre sure. that were there for me, watched Cadre. Like their high speed action was getting burned and shot in Iran when the whole mission got fucked up. You follow? That's the time period. Okay. So I'm there, and of course they're going to do psychological. I mean, that <laughs> goes without saying. Of course, now everybody knows about it, but back then nobody knew shit or anything. So I'm there, and they're doing heavy psychological. I mean, crazy stuff like eight hours, 10 hours, you know, like all these big tests. And to understand how is your military and where is it going, here it is. I'm sitting there in a very white room. Could look like a sci-fi movie. Something like maybe out of Lucy, if you've seen the movie. You know what I'm saying? The doctors, the white room, the lights. Doc comes out. He's like a full bird colonel. He's wearing a jacket, you know, make him look medical. We sit on stainless steel stools. Knees are touching. You know, we're real close. <laughs> he wants to talk to me. He's like, Sergeant Stott. I'm like, sir. He goes, uh, you're manic depression. You're manic depressive. And I look at him, you know, and I go, um, what's a manic depressive? And he says, if I put that down, he says, you won't be able to be in special ops. So this is the whole like, you know, Hollywood telltale, you know, pause for dramatic effect. And I look at him and he looks at me eye to eye. And I say, well, sir, I guess I'm not manic depressive. And he says, Sergeant, I guess you're not. <laughs> Okay. <laughs> so, cool. so yeah, because I mean, if you're a functional bipolar as I am and people that were functional are like Lincoln, Churchill, Mozart, you know what I mean? When you got it, you got it. I mean, what people really false diagnose within the bipolar world is they just say like a super A plus personality or something. Well, you're not. I mean, you're that plus and you have a really bad downside. You know, you know, let's talk about it. It is a bipolar, which is what it is now, it used to be manic depressive, and then they didn't know what the hell it was, and you were just, you know, out there. But the point is, it's got a 50% suicide rate. I didn't, I, you know, not 10, not 20, not 30. How about 50%? Wow. 50. <laughs> now, if you're a male and you've got the negative attributes, which are going to be aggressiveness, uh, criminality, breaks from reality, most of the male bipolars, if they didn't blow their brains out and they're not functional, they're probably in prison. A lot of mental disease in prison. You know what? Bad road for the male. You see that often. Oh, it is. It's yeah. bad. So what I'm saying, and then somewhere in there, you have the shark like myself swimming around. There's been, like I said, a few of us. You know, they're very functional. And my blessing or gift within the whole bipolar whatever, both good and bad, has been I have an ability – they kind of almost have an outer body. I, I mean, I hear myself speak. I see it. I get it. I, I get it. So therefore, if you're that kind of person, have you ever watched or studied anything on savants? Savants? Of course. Savants? Yeah. Well, what I'm saying is, you know, most of them just do their shit. Like Raymond, they don't know why they do their shit, right? They don't. Most don't. They're like, I just do my shit. How do you do that? I don't know. I just do it, right? 
they can't really tell or share with other people what's going on. Now, when they do, and they have some out there, they can, it's special. And that's really what I have within the whole bipolar, meaning as a postcard bipolar, look it up, you know, my picture should be right there. You know what I'm saying? Like, bam, here's what can happen to you. <laughs> Bankruptcies, foreclosures, repossessions, prison, state, federal, you know, tax, you're going to have, there it is. That's me. That's on the resume. So I'm the poster child within the effects. The difference is I see it, learn from it and grow. So it's a neat thing. So if anything, I was lucky because, you know, you either act out introvert, uh, internally and that's leading to suicide or externally. Right. And for me, it was lucky I had that combination plus an external action out because <laughs> if you, you know, you get down in your internal, you want to hold it in, you end up, you know, hanging yourself or blowing your brains out. Right. So for me, yeah. it was external and that's what led to prison stuff and, you know, violence. And did you end up going to prison twice? Yeah. I went to federal and state. Leavenworth. How much time did you did you serve? One year till they pardoned me. How many? One year in isolation. Oh, wow. yeah. oh. Eight by six cell, twenty four seven camera burning light on, twenty four seven. Yeah, I mean the story I share with you there because they're just cute. Like the thing that makes it interesting to make Greg Stott, or if we want to use the fight name Greg Ranger Stott, you know. But the whole point is it's cool because that's what I was. So you take a guy like me. One of the things I did at Bragg was I was part of the whole SEER instructor, uh, SEER instructor cadre, you know, get this whole thing going, survival, escape, resistance, evasion, you follow. So I'm, I'm literally the guy that's teaching the guys what to do when the enemy captures you. <laughs> so right. guess who captured me? The U.S. government. So did, did, <laughs> you also have a, <laughs> did you also have a, a pro wrestling background? No, that's how I found out about the UFC. Because I was connected with Ivan Koloff. He was trying to bring me in. That would have been in 93. It, and You didn't want to do pro wrestling? I did it with them, but I don't like it. Yeah, I didn't like it. I was a shooter. I mean, I'm a real, you know what I mean? Not only a right. real shooter, like, you know what I'm saying? I mean, I'm the, you know, pop up. What, what the hell are we doing here? I, you know, it was not that I'm this exceptional wrestler that was fortunate like Mark to work within a league and a college and go. I mean, I could. I mean, I, had, I came from a really good pedigree in Tom's River, New Jersey. Uh, Coach DeMarco is legendary. He's in the Hall of Fame in New Jersey wrestling. You know what I'm saying? The high school we had, 4A, was top shit. And I was part sure. of it. So I liked the wrestling thing. And then I did the military thing because, you know, we just talked about abuse, wrestling, athlete, leave. You're in the service, right? <laughs> so in the service, I'd wrestle, I'd fight. We'd do the, uh, you know, the other thing about the service, when you talk about fighting or any type of combat stuff, that's what you did. You see what I'm saying? We used to call them smokers in the old days. You put on the gloves. All the commanders put out their best men. You punch it out. You know what I'm saying? It used to be yeah. uh, it's more old army. You know what I'm saying? Uh, the old army like every five years. But what I'm saying is the 80s was still, let, let's just say, Greg, what do you mean old? Well, I come from the Fort Bragg. You know, I'm still here in North Carolina. So Fort Bragg's the largest military base of personnel in the world. I didn't say the United, in, in the world. I mean, it's unbelievable, the personnel we have. Fayetteville has a street called Hay Street. It's legendary. In the days when I was in, it was still post-Vietnam. It was called Vietnam, Vietnam, meaning when I was in, it was still, ready? No civilian police on Hay Street, where all the bars were and the strip bars, everything. It was like the Old West. They wore the stupid helmets that said MP. They carried the 45. They policed up the area. Friggin' Mama San pulled you into friggin' strip bars. They had two-way windows. Guys were coming through windows with knives in them, shootouts, fun. It was a different time. You couldn't even think to do that stuff now. You know, we got the cancel culture. I say the wrong friggin' word. They want to friggin' put a bullet in me. So back then, that was what was going on. So it was a different world, different time. But yeah, to answer your question, I think it was good time and service. Uh, the story was there to tell you, we love you when you're Mr. Manic. You can plan so well. You're a great com. We'd love to go ahead and get your potion, whatever you're doing. But when you went to the other cycle, which I did, which unfortunately caused some people a lot of harm and bodily injury. Then they said, you got to go away to prison. And then when um, I was in, you know, for that whole time, it was all awkward because as a combat veteran, somebody who's decorated, you know what I mean? Ranger Pathfinder done the stuff. They go, why the hell is this guy sitting in a cell? When you go to prison, by the way, even if it's a screwy court martial, 
what will happen is when you land, you get assigned a lawyer out of Washington, D.C. You follow? There's somebody yeah. that's actually there to, you know, what the hell is he doing there? Well, the trick that got their attention was when they got a memorandum. Are you ready for this? <laughs> you know, a memorandum. Is that an old word or do people still get it? No, that? no, it's a memo. Yeah, yeah. yeah but, but, well, it's a little different. Let me put it. A memorandum in the military means that everybody's going to read it. If I send you a private letter, it comes to you. If I send a memorandum and I'm up higher than you, then the chain of command gets to see it. You follow? Okay. Kind of everyone's going to see this. Now, guess where it's pretty coming from pretty high. The letter is from Henry Shelton. You recognize that name? He was the Joint Chief of State. He was chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff at one time. Well, he I had served with him many a time. He was in the Pentagon at the time and he was a member of the Joint Chiefs of Staff. He wasn't the he was going to go on to become the chairman, the number one general in all the world. But at the time, he was Army Joint Chiefs of Staff. He was there. Positioning. Yeah, so positioning. Huh? He was still climbing. He was positioning. Well, no, no, no. I mean, if you're on the – if well, I mean, we're talking two-star general, so we ain't talking climbing. I mean, the dude, what I'm saying, he's going to go on to be the number one general in the world. But the point is Henry Shelton, who's a North Carolina guy who I was serving with, wrote the memorandum to get me out of prison. The last line I'll quote for you, I have the memorandum, I keep it in my office so everybody can, you know, see it. It's like archived. The last line was release prisoner Stott now so he can be the great American I know will be. That's on Pentag now, now back in that day, we're talking 1989. That was uh, well, 88 actually is when he wrote it. That's typewriter. So you know what I'm saying? We're talking Pentagon stationary, type, signed, Henry Shelton. So That's when cool. that memorandum floated down, it got attention. And I ended up getting pardoned by the uh, Secretary of the Army, Casper Weinberg. And it was kind of like something out of the Old Testament. You know, when Peter got out of the jail, you know, they were all praying for him. If you're a little going back on a biblical lesson, he was in jail and they wanted him out. And all of a sudden the guards went to sleep, the doors opened and Peter walked out. And that's kind of what happened to me. I just basically it was like 24 hours later, I'm back in uh, North Carolina. So you were away for a year. How much time did you get pardoned? How much time did they take off your sentence? Two years. Okay. That's a long time, man. That's a long time. a long time. Yeah, I mean, it was a real deal, especially that, and then me playing the games, and then, you know, the as far as with them, they were happy to see me go. I mean, being that, you know, like I said, uh, to give an illustration, uh, I, had, I was in an isolation block the whole time, and we all had uh, – slots like you know to see through you know they could see us on camera but the point was i got the rest of the people talking with an australian accent i used to have this uh, big water bug that came up through the shitter i made a paper mache little harness for them they'd come by you know you have no clocks you try to keep some relationship to time so i'd be sitting on this thing and they pull your shit man there's no bed there's no nothing one book bible steel sit there five o'clock take a mattress fuck you See you in the morning. So the point is, I'd be sitting on the metal, and I'd have my little leash, and I knew when the dimwads were coming to look through the thing, and I'd be walking the little bug around the cell. You know, it was like, <laughs> oh, fuck with their brains. Fuck them. Then I had this thing. It's called a bounce-back technique. When you get locked up, maybe I'm teaching somebody something right now. So if you get fucking locked up and you want to fuck with them, what you do is you want to get out of the cell, right? Because I'm only getting the shower once a week. So I got to get the fuck out. So what you do is you take a little nail blood whatever you know you cut the nostril it's really soft it's mucusy it'll scab gives yourself a nosebleed on demand so every day at the same time i pull the scab get the blood going put it on my face they do the little slot check i'd be sitting there all like professional on the little steel bunk you know hands on my knees i'd say excuse me sir prisoner stott seems to be hemorrhaging from all the excitement I'd say that every fucking day. They take me out, rush me to medical, fucking wash my face, get a chance to get out. It's called a bounce back technique when you're being interrogated. <laughs> so I used to teach it. I did it. Fuck them. I went to school. <laughs> you got to <laughs> get little creative ways to entertain yourself. That's what I'm life, trying though. to say, right? Yeah, you you know, have make, to. A, make a chest set out of toilet paper, you know, the whole deal. You know? <laughs> All right. Let's talk about your introduction to the UFC. How does this come together? Because that's yeah, not an different. easy lift at that time. No, I you, you hit it right on the head. It really wasn't. I mean, what a weird time, right? I, it, and, I, and I'm and i a pretty good better, and I am a professional gambler. 
uh, if I had laid odds, I would have thought that whole thing was going to blow up. I thought it was, you know, there had no chance based on that. And I usually bet pretty right, but I would have lost my ass off, you know, that it would have ever grown into what it did. But at that time, with the lens I was looking through, you know, it was a one off. You know, I was like, you got to get in. This is kind of cool. It could be neat. Uh, I didn't like the pro wrestling thing. And that's where I kind of had a natural gravitation to go to. You know, I'm here. I'm post military. I'm making money in cars. I'm young. See, the whole thing you got to remember is I'm, I'm old in certain things, but I'm young, too. I did the military thing. I mean, hell, I'm pumping in all that I told you about the military. I'm 27 years old. I get out, and in my first year of getting out, I make a million bucks in the car industry. I took the cars like a freaking duck to water. It was it, plus, you know, I had a year to think about shit. That was it. So it was a little unfair to the civilian populace when you let a very positive A plus functional bipolar out. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> it's like, you know, it's kind of like Genghis Khan shit. You know, I just took over. <laughs> You know, boom. <laughs> and then no. my score, my scorecard was zeros in my bank account. I used to have a banker that said, what are you, a drug dealer or something? You know, I'm depositing 60, 70, $80,000 a month. So, but the cars, they were big. And plus that was the old West. You know, you're talking about that time period. It was uh, to any car vets that are out there. They'll know what I'm talking about. We don't see those times that much now, but back then uh, life was good. And if you were wild and had connections and could play the, you know, stereotypical crazy car guy, uh, wow, there was some dollars to be made. Now, let, let me ask you a little bit um, about the UFC. The UFC actually did a Carolina event early, or, you know, before your event. I think it was the UFC yeah. three or somewhere three. around. I was, yeah, I was there. I was there with Ken because so – Ken was the connection, right? So we got to tie some names. What about Ken Shamrock? Here, here, right, Ken Shamrock, his dad, Frank, you know, his dad, his uh, brother, you know, yes. Frank. But the point was, Frank was actually, at that time, I liked Frank, and we talked more as his career grew. You know, he was younger, obviously, than Ken. Ken and I are about the same age, you know, so that was the, the connection. But the connection wasn't because we're buds or having beer together. It was that Ivan, you know, he was so uh, doing the pro wrestling thing through Ivan. That's how he got into the pro wrestling. Ivan Kola, the Russian oh, bear. Legendary, legendary, yeah, legendary wrestler, right. So Charlotte, pro wrestler. Right, yes. and for people that don't know or are watching, because you guys are out in Chicago, right? I am. Yeah. I'm talking Chicago, but the point is, whatever, I don't know anything about really Chicago, but the point is in Charlotte, uh, Charlotte is the Hollywood. You're like, you know what, you want to be in movies? Guess what? You go to friggin' Hollywood, right? You want to be yes. on Broadway? Where do you go? New York? You want to be a pro wrestler? Charlotte at the time, you know, Charlotte was the shit. Now, you know, there's going to be some asshole out there. Somebody go, I don't know. I went in Oklahoma or I was down in Florida. Yeah, there was all regional shit. There was no Vince McMahon. He hadn't done his shit yet. You know what I'm saying? It was still regional. Sure. But but what I'm saying is Charlotte was a mecca. You know what I mean? You had, sure. Claire, you, had, you had people. If you wanted to get into pro wrestling, it was fortunate. It was a couple hour drive for me. And that's where I decided to go. And I got hooked up with Ivan. And then through Ivan, and then Ken... Ken was doing the Pancre and all the shit in Japan. He's having success over there. And uh, then was seeing the wrestling, you know, probably because of the money, you know, maybe of the future to the money. And when he wasn't there, I, yeah, he did capitalize on it later on, as you know, you know, after his UFC career. But uh, but that was the connection. So he went and he says, I'm going to this thing. Said, you know, stop by, take a peek, you know, whatever. He was telling me how it looked pretty good. You know, if you don't want to do the role and the kind of the, the work, you know, as they call it, you're doing the work in pro wrestling. He says, come see uh, what we got going. I'm doing this thing, UFC thing. <laughs> so uh, I went over there in Charlotte, yeah. And how, how did it look to you? Because wrestling at the end of the day, you know, especially in, in that era, was very formula, you know, a very nice formula they had of bringing out. Yeah, and, and, and the UFC seems like a lot more chaotic. But what was your impression? What do you remember? Like, what can you well, tell yeah, us? I, I remember, well, also I had the business savvy, you know, at the time. Right, I made money, you know. I mean, I had Ooh. stuff. I understood marketing, you know. I mean, I had my own little view on things at the time, even though I'm a young buck. You definitely understood marketing. You absolutely Well, you know what I'm saying. I made money. I've done things. I got it. No, you know no, 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 no. The way you marketed yourself has people still remembering who you are today. Oh, you I got one. You. You had one instance to appear in the UFC. Yeah. And we're talking right now because of the way you marketed yourself. Right. I got you. Yeah. 
Yeah, well, look, we're going to talk about that. That was quite a little scheme on my part. Yeah, I mean, yeah. How did I did that. That that's coming. But I was going to answer your question, so Charlotte. So really, what we got? If we put a little loop around it, it's there's Ivan Kolov, the Russian bear. We're down there training, and I'm rolling, and I'm not liking everything that I see. The word goes through the grapevine because it's not that even that Ken and I are working together. You know, it's just that we have the connection through Ivan, right? He's the lighthouse, mm-hmm. and the, the word goes. Uh, Ken's doing something different. You ought to check it out. And I say, yeah. And then I meet Ken, his dad, Frank, before he goes on to do his thing that night. And I watch it and I think, wow, this is pretty cool. You know, this is, um, it's a neat angle. In my life, we used to have the bear pit. And, uh, you know, I've heard some assholes, the trolls out there online, they don't know. Well, they don't know. You know, that time period, what I'm saying is we didn't run in sneakers. We wore combat boots. We got into a friggin' sawdust pit. Anything went. You know what I'm saying? Like, you know, and we didn't even stop to say, don't kick them in the balls or freaking, you know, fish hook them. I mean, it's literally anything goes. And the whole objective was to throw the son of a bitch out of the pit. And I was rather good at it. And I liked it. And so, therefore, when I'm seeing this octagon thing, you know, cage, I, I dug it. I thought it was cool. So it got my attention. Let's just say that. It's good. 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 The North Carolina veteran that, that was on that show, Roland Payne, did you – uh? Ever have a run in with him or meet him or talk to him or nothing? Nothing, nothing. Because if you're going in that time frame, and I think you are speaking 93 ish. Yeah. Okay. Let's try to get some years because you got to get what's happening. So there's 93, they're trying to do their shit. UFC's trying to do whatever they're doing. I get turned on by the Charlotte incident, you know, seeing it. And then. I got to start formulating a plan on how to get in because like you said, there isn't like, you know, push this button, talk to so-and-so. It was a little tricky dicky. So what I felt was they wanted a little tape. They wanted some type of rep, right? What are you going to do? And I'm not going to just tell them, Hey, I'm a freaking, you know, I'm not going to go through what I just went with you with this bullshit with the service and stuff. So what I decided to do is my wife and I, this is pretty important. So hold yourself, watch this. I'm freaking sitting in a beautiful house. On a beautiful bed. I got my wife televisions on. And guess what we see? A commercial. And the commercial says, do you think you're tough? You know, it's got this kind of Mich- Michigan accent. It's, it's this, it's this fucker. What was his name? It's not Art of Door. Davey? No, no, no. Well, no. Davey, I like. No, his name is Art of Door. I got it right. They're both Art, so it screws me up in the head. Ready? Okay. You got Art Davey. I love him, right, for the UFC. Then you got this guy named Art of Door. And Art of Door is the guy who created Tough Man. So he has this commercial and he's like this. He's like on the TV, you know, he's like, so you think you're tough? Come and show us how tough you are. Dial 1-800-TOUGH-MAN right now. So my wife looks at me. I look at her. It's like spontaneous. She says, dial 1-800-TOUGH-MAN. I reach over. I get the fucking phone. Bop, 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 bop. Hey, I'm fucking tough. Where is it? <laughs> 1-800-TOUGH-MAN. No shit. There it is. Yeah, so you did a tough man competition? Oh, fuck, I won everything. I won. I was fucking killed. I was knocking people out. They used to accuse me of putting fucking shit in my fist. Go back and watch the tape on UFC 15 from the announcer that saw me fight as a tough man. And he goes, when I when I had on there all the bullshit they made you say about, we didn't know what the, what, did, what the hell were we doing? You know, we're getting in there to fight. So you had to say, like, uh, like submission, knockout, all this shit. So I, I mixed it up. You know what I'm saying? Mixed martial, even though we weren't calling it that, it was no holds bar. I'm in there with the little resume thing saying, you know, I like to knock them out. I'll whatever submission. I threw the word. I hadn't submitted anybody. Anyway, I said it. And because I said it and it really wasn't believable. Listen, I mean, go back. It's really a cute clip. The announcer guy that's doing the thing goes, I watched him fight. He knocks everybody out. I don't know why he says he's going to submit anybody. <laughs> well, that was the truth. I, I mean, that, I'm, I'm a puncher. You know what I'm saying? I'm a, I mean, that's, that was it. It was like, <laughs> So in your you had a pre-fight interview with Joe Gold from Full Contact yeah, Fighter. I watched it. It was it's cute. I, I, I just I, commented I, on it this morning. Very pro wrestling. It. Very pro wrestling back then. No, but you said you know I'm going to close the distance, keep yeah. them off balance. No, I had a strategy. Uh, misdirect, finish the fight. Yeah. Like it's. But I didn't talk about the fucking. Uh, what did I take? How much did they have me on? Let me see. Eight hundred. 1,600 milligrams of Depakote. I didn't throw that into the equation. No, anyway. no, no, you definitely didn't do that. <laughs> if I had thrown that in, it might have changed the strategy. <laughs> but, like, that type of verbiage was very advanced back then. For That type of verbiage was very advanced back then for the time. 
for well, death. I was, a fight. I was a fighter. Remember, I'm not some shithead. You know, all these people, ah, la, la, I could have done, well, fuck you. You didn't, could have done shit. I was actually, you know, people looking for me with fucking knives, take them out, fight, real shit. I mean, I was a fighter. And <laughs> at the time, I was part of the program at Bragg because, you know, we're really going back in time. We're in the 80s, right? Yeah. When I'm in the middle, I mean, this is older shit. Post Vietnam, we're trying to figure shit out. We had a very antiquated hand to hand system back then. I mean, we were like fucking G.I. Joe's trying to do, you know, World War II shit. Anyway, I mean, that's when I met the Gracies. They came to Bragg to kind of train us and show some jujitsu shit in 87. And uh, so, way long, you know, before everybody's getting ideas, I'm part of this kind of pre thing. I didn't like the jujitsu thing, you know, back then, because uh, I don't give a shit if it's Gracie this or Gracie that. I'm fucking fighting somebody to the death. I'm not rolling. The, I, you're not getting me the fuck on the ground. I'm going to kill your ass fast, you know, while we're standing. And so what became a much more popular art form was Wing Chun Kung Fu, because it still is. It's one of the more favored uh, hand-to-hand defenses in real life kind of deal. And, of course, Hollywood picked up on it because it looks cool when you're trapping, you know, the whole fighting in a phone booth shit, Matrixy. Except now they've even put in some of the jujitsu stuff, you know, because, of course, that's evolved, too, from what they were showing back in 87, you know. So if I was going to roll, it would have been, hey, I'm a grappler. But as far as fighting someone with hands, uh, I was already studying with one of the top Sifus that handles all the special operations, Sifu Edwards, out of Fayetteville, North Carolina. And that's where the verbiage comes and the knowledge of, you know, closing distance and gate. You see what I'm saying? So. Yeah, but that, that was that was very very advanced for the time. We for the time, I, well, I'm telling you where it came from. I'm saying it yeah. didn't come. I didn't, you know. I mean, it wasn't osmosis. I'm fucking studying right. with dudes, but this shit's real. You know, I didn't fucking go, hey, that's cool, or it's a bullshit book, you know. But um, yeah, that's how we did it back. Then. You know, we hey. had to know how do I close the fucking day? And, and it wouldn't be because the dude was just taller. He might have a friggin' knife or gun. You know. Now, take us through. Making that phone call to the tough man competition to actually getting in the UFC because you, you went to yeah. UFC three and you fought UFC fifteen. So that's yeah, a couple of years went by. What was your application process like? Knocking people out. I mean, that's fight. I had like damn a lot of fight. I used to, you know, you used yeah. to fight three to four times a night in a tough man show. The only problem was when I fought at the Ritz, and I'm trying to get the fucking video from Fox because Jesus, it was so cool. This is a cute little story. So here's my tough man story to give you a little bite. So I go to tough man after I already won the North Carolina tough man up at the Ritz or excuse me, Dorton arena. That's a big arena up here. And they had the big, you know, art, you know, 1-800 tough man. He said, anyway, that led to the big meet at a big arena. And I did well. Next thing that happens is I want to go ahead and fight some more. You know, I'm getting a resume. I'm trying to, you know, get some shit going. So they have a fight at this place called the Ritz, which looks like something out of a Mad Max movie. It's one of these bars up here. It still exists. And so they set the ring up on like the dance floor area and you got the tables all around it, but you got an upper deck where people were looking down. So very cool for a small content. You know what I mean? Uh, Yelling, you know, they can throw shit. They're all right there. So anyway, do you guys understand the tough man format? Maybe some of your viewers don't tough man means, you're wearing boxing gloves. It's a boxing match, one minute rounds. But the point that makes it kind of cool, because that isn't cool. Boxing gloves, not cool. Slash, you know, one minute rounds, not cool. What makes it cool and can help in any other type of fighting scenario is you don't know who the frig you're fighting. So there's 34 guys, right? They're all sitting on chairs. And then they just call your number and you fight so-and-so, which is very reminiscent of like football drills where two guys hit, you don't know you and you go bam, yeah. uh, kind of like, you know what I'm saying? It's a cool thing. So anyway, they draw my name. I'm the first guy of the night and they take this other cat to fight. Right. So now I'm hoping I'm painting the picture. They say I do that pretty good. I'm giving you the verbal. Hopefully you're, you're seeing what I'm seeing. We're at the Ritz, you know, Mad Max kind of environment. First fight of a night. There's 30 other guys, 32 guys sitting in chairs, you know, ready to watch what the hell's going to go on. Who am I going to fight? I don't know, but these two, we'll see who wins. We get in there and this guy, he's looking pretty good. You know, he's, he's not a, he's not a beer gut bouncer dude. He's, you know, kind of fit, favored himself a boxer. And if they had a heavyweight class, we're all in the heavyweight class. So the bell rings, this guy comes out though. And he winds up like he's coming from Texas to hit me. I duck under it and a nice uppercut. Time on the clock, eight seconds. This cat's out for four minutes. Four minutes. Now, boxing protocol, you don't get out of the ring. 
Nobody leaves, you know, when somebody's unconscious. That's four minutes in the Ritz with everybody going nuts. So what a great environment. So you think it's cool until the promoter tells you the next day when I show up, because it was a multi-day event to get it all done. He says, I, I love the knockout, but you fucked me. I said, what do you mean I fucked you? He says, after you knocked that guy out like that, nobody showed up. The, <laughs> the other fighters didn't even want to come to fight the next day. Sure. So was, that really sucked. You know, he had a couple fights and I won and that was it. But <laughs> So how do you thread the needle from tough man to get to the UFC? Well, you, you don't. it's all marketing, all marketing, all marketing. You know what I mean? Were there was no, were, were, you, you, were you mailing them tapes? Like, no, they... hell no, no. It was a lot of phone calls, a couple phone calls. And um, I, 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 I mean, Ken could have said something. You know what I'm saying? Like somebody had my name somewhere, you know, through the Ivan Ken. You know what I mean? Somebody might have dropped the name. I don't know. They knew who I was. At least there's a name, right? which is one step better than nobody knowing anything. And then um, I get the call. This would be in uh, UFC 11. Okay. Around the, and so that's, uh, let me check, September 96. So do we do pretty good? So where are we at? 93, we're in Charlotte. 94, I'm a tough man champ, right? I'm still fighting in 95, trying to figure it out. And I get a call in September from um, Art Davies. And... He says, you know, I hear your name. I sent him material, you know, like a little resume, fight resume shit, you know, that type of deal. You know, back then, what are we talking about? Again, 94, 95, you know, video sucked. I mean, everything was primitive as far as, you know, communicating. No internet. It, no, it, was, it, was, it was slow. So, I mean, I might have mailed him something, right? <laughs> Yellow, stick some stamps, send him some stuff. Right. Anyway, he opens it up. He sees some stuff. He, he digs kind of the ranger thing or whatever. And he calls me which is all you want to do anyway, right? Send him something to make him call. So he calls and we talk. He says, uh, I don't know what you're doing this weekend, but we got this thing down in Augusta, Georgia. And uh, why don't you come down? I'll meet you. We'll talk. We'll see. You know, well, being a New Yorker, that's all I need. You know, get my foot in the door. I'm there like I'll be there with bells on. And I was. Now I thought what to do. So I went and got a white shirt. I took a ranger tab. I sewed it on the shirt. So I had a white shirt with a ranger tab sewed on it. I had these cards made up that were kind of cool. They kind of, you know, I could hand to someone, had the resume on it. It told a little about who I was, you know, when a promo card. Smart. You know what I'm saying? Like, I didn't go yeah. just like, hi, you know, let me shake your hand. You'll remember me. I got shit on. I looked visual. I got the high end time doing the whole deal. So I walked down there and, uh, you know, the Masters was going on at the time. It's in Augusta. And I go into this thing, see the event. It was pretty cool. And, um, I find art and he tell he gives me um behind the one of those passes, he gives me a pass to kind of check things out, you know. He says we're gonna have an after party. We'll talk then after the event. And that's what ended up happening. Um, you know, I checked things out, met some of the fighters, da 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 da, and uh watched the fight and then went to the uh, party afterwards. And that was kind of cool. Drinks, talk, Coleman, you know, tank, meet people. Any personalities? Yeah, yeah, no, for sure. Or Belfort, you know what I'm saying? It was, it was definitely personality heavy. Personality thing, and and to me, I didn't see too big of a thing between the pro wrestling. You know what I mean? From that standpoint, other than we weren't going to work when we got in the ring, but there was a lot of personalities. You you almost could see them almost innately trying to create a heel baby face concept. You know what I'm saying? If if I may interject here, okay. we had here we had uh, Conan Silvera. Okay. Jason Delucia, both of them have said, "Yeah, you had to have titles. Like the only oh, way yeah. the UFC no. would take you is if you had titles. Whatever. Yeah, you know, he's like, if you wanted to fight in the UFC, you had to have titles. And was I even like read off some of Conan Silvera's titles to him? Yeah, what yeah. does this mean? And he's like, dude, what do I know, man? What the fuck? He, well, that's where the, the tournaments. You, that's where the fucking bear pit came in. You see what I'm saying? I mean, I, it was nothing official. It's true. I mean, I fought a lot in these bear pits and beat the shit out of a lot of people. I mean, I fought a lot of people. But it was this whole ranger bear pit. You follow what I'm saying? I'm not going to You had to. D had Delucia to. said, he's yeah. like, I had some point fighting t uh, tournament wins. Right. He's like, I couldn't submit them. I couldn't do it. That's why I was an alternate. They wouldn't let me into the main tournament. That's what he said. Well, if we're going to move on to that, you'll hear the story of how that worked out. Because, that, you know, right now, I think, where are we at? We're in 96. I'm at the after party. Uh, I actually was a little bit rough to Vitor Belfort's promoter's bodyguard. 
face. And that's what got a lot of attention. I figured I'd go heel. So when they came into the hotel where everything was at, I kind of like, you know, bumped into them, let them get a little tough. You know what I'm saying? Test them. You know, like if you're ever testing somebody. Anyway, they didn't want to do shit. And I, all I was doing was the bravado and fuck it. You know, Art saw it, comes over. It looked like a work, but, you know, nobody knew what the fuck was going on. He's like, hey, man, it's all right, Ranger. He's like, we'll see you at the party, you know. So, anyway. Well, was, was that the after fight party that Tank got into a fight with, with Vitor's Tank crew? And, Tank and Coleman, yeah. Okay. Yeah, see, it was yeah. with the Brazilian. It was the Brazilian thing, yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Yeah, so we're, we're, the, atm the atmosphere was, and that was kind of a work. Nobody's punching anybody too bad. I mean, there could have been something between somebody. I, I just listened to Coleman tell his story about it. I think he got it wrong, by the way, because I was there. He said it was USC 12. It wasn't. It was fucking USC 11. Um, so, the, you know what I'm saying? He doesn't even remember. You know, and he was there. He's the guy. <laughs> but it, fucking, it was 11. Because I was there and I wasn't at fucking 12. So that's how we eliminated. You might have been at 11, 12, 13, 14. But I was there at 11. And, so so uh, was I. I. I was in that. So this was the – the after fight party is not – like the UFC after the fight parties now. It's in a conference oh, room. Oh, I was so primitive. Everything's so they primitive. Wheeled in, they wheeled in a, a, a hotel employee with like a bar, you know, a little bar. Yes, some yes. Right. Stuff like that. So, kind of like so, a bad wedding. A bad wedding, you know. <laughs> <laughs> bad wedding party. Hey, get a free drink. All right, thanks. Wow, this is great. But we did that, and you mingled. I passed out cards to every fucking buddy. Everybody did the Ranger. You know, I brought a stack this big. Here you go, Ranger, Ranger, Ranger. So a lot of Ranger. And uh, I was pretty manic. Things were cool. Training was all right. I was, you know, I was right at that point. You know, Depakote was low or not even existent, really, at 11. wasn't even there. No, I know it wasn't there because they didn't start fucking me up with the uh, psychotropic drugs until after 97. Yeah, it was in 97. 97 in that earlier parts when they got me i actually turned myself in that's a cute story it's short it's that i literally you know i'm whacked i mean i'm as whacked as it gets things are bad and i mean let me just say you say you're supposed to say when i say i'm really whack whack bad your line is supposed to say how whack were you greg like, yeah, right. Right. How whack were you? i was so whack that i'm making all this money in the car lot and all my employees were allowed to carry guns not to shoot people that would come in, but to kill me. <laughs> to protect True. themselves. Of course. Yeah. Right. Of course. I'm like a fucking werewolf. I mean, if I go fucking off, I mean, <laughs> I mean, it was the old wet. I mean, there's none of this, I think. It just happens. My wife would say, if Jesus Christ was sitting there, you know, I mean, you're just going. It's, it's It doesn't matter. There's not a title, the cop, the president. It doesn't matter. So, so anyway, I turned myself in is what I'm saying. That's how we get to the psych And I go to this guy. My line's pretty cool. I go into Sanford Lee County Mental Health. And I sit down with this guy. I'm driving a friggin', you know, beautiful car, dressed in the nines. And I say, I'm not leaving. He says, what do you mean you're not leaving? I said, I'm pretty fucked up. I said, uh, you're going to think that I'm pretty successful and I'm a straight up guy. And I said, but you're wrong. I said, I, I, they said I was manic depressive. I got to be this shit. Something's wrong. I need some help. And it was that kind of direct approach is when I, you know, turned myself in. And I mean, the guy took some notice and it was pretty obvious after he stripped some layers and spent some time with me that I was a poster child. Of freaking, like, you know, <laughs> uh, matter of fact, they had me so bad at the time. The word is called cycling. And uh, that's where you cycle in and out of a manic and a depressive cycle. The faster you cycle, like they get worried about you if you're doing it every few months. I'm worried. Okay. Then if you're doing it like every one in the month, a couple times, they're like, man, this is really a scary issue. Something bad's going to happen. I was fucking cycling like multiple times in the day. Oh, yeah. shit. Yeah. You see what I'm saying? I mean, if I had more of the, I think I should just go ahead and end it. Like I wanted to internalize it. I'd probably be dead. But how I I was external, so I just whacked people. No, I'm gonna ask you. Bro. <laughs> so now you can talk to me. So why do you employ that character? You know, I, I take it out on everybody. And then, uh, but I was gonna ask you on 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 the real side too. You, as a child, you suffered a lot of abuse. In yeah. the military, it's not exactly you know you're put through like a very manly training without a lot of like coddling. You know what I mean? So it's like you don't address any of your no feelings. 
Yeah, you, you know, not, I mean, there are the, we didn't know the word coddle. There's no coddle. Yeah, well, it, it, so is this the moment when you turned yourself in that you kind of had that that moment uh, to take care of yourself and go back and and maybe start analyzing all the damage done and stuff? You know, is that is that the moment or did it come afterwards? No, no, no. I mean, I was seeing – well, I, here's the problem. When you, It's just like the, uh, the old addicts out there can relate. Anybody that has something, they got to come with introspection to a realization point. I think that's kind of where you're driving, right? Mm -hmm. You finally kind of have that aha, you know, hey, I'm an alcoholic, you know, I'm going to yeah. admit it. Hey, I'm, a, I'm fucking bipolar. Like, it's real. Like, you don't have to fucking tell me anymore. I get it. That's about where it's at. It's just the aha of I'm going to admit. Uh, because now, now remember, here's the part. Everybody thinks when you do the aha, whether it's the alky, the, the narcotics, the bipolar mental disease, that life gets better. Au contraire. You see what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. It gets harder. I slept like a baby when I was freaking telling everybody else they were crazy. I loved it. You're all fucked up. I'm not fucked up. You see? But when you say I'm fucked up, oh, the world changes. Oh, yeah, big time. Big see time. what I'm saying? Like, I'm, no. I, you yeah. gotta use the word. It's not you. I'm yeah. fucked up. You point your fingers at everybody else. Now yeah. It's oh, it's great. I'm sleep. Yeah. I, I slept like a baby. Yeah. I'm it. I could go rob a bank and go ahead and have disease. No problem. You know, it's my money. Yeah. It's good. Did but, you ever think, did you ever think about going to train with Ken Shamrock out in California? No, I was invited by his pop. That was really supposed to happen, except that I had a fucking family and kids and, there was no money in the game. So, you know, I mean, it was really going to have to be what, well, you know, I might as well go join the fucking French foreign legion. I'm saying, you know what, why am I going to do it? I'm living in a house. I've business. you know what I mean? It's, there's no money. Remember we're talking here. Here's what they offered you ready. $500 in appearance, 500. Yeah, That's when you've got in. What the fuck are you, you know, like 500. So people don't understand anyone that was fighting back then was doing it to fight. There's no money. Yeah, and that means somebody says you're gonna fight so and so, or like me, you're gonna fight in a tournament, right? You're gonna fight three fights in a night, and you can make five hundred bucks. And if you win the whole freaking thing, we give you twenty five. Yeah. Your agent, your agent gets twenty percent. <laughs> so I mean, it had a little mob racketeering thing, had a little pro wrestling thing, it had a little this thing. And they were still shaking it up, trying to figure out their formula. So we heard rumors that you chose to fight Mark Kerr. They, they, no, not only chose, I demanded. And the reason is I'm fucking 34. I just told, first of all, I'm fucking sick in the head. I just explained that to you. So on the manic side, on the good day, remember, if you get the good Greg, I'm like, but look, my face is the same, right? This side. This side. So if you call me on this side, I could kick anybody's ass in the world, right? You know, because I am, I'm that guy. So I'm like, fuck you. I mean, am I going to fight some fucker, you know, over here? And then I'm going to go through this 500,000, 2,000 thing? Or am I going to fight on the main card? Now, it worked like a two-edged sword. At that time, not only did I demand, but nobody wanted to fight him. Yeah. Now, I'm going to say that again. No one wanted to fight Mark Kerr. You know, so I, I would no like to see your... Anybody disagreeing with that statement yeah. needs to go and look at right. a picture of Mark Kerr. <laughs> well, not only that, but or if they could be lucky enough to watch some of the Brazilian tapes of him fucking pulling people back in the ring. and That's how he got his nickname, the Smashing Machine. Mm -hmm. So what I'm saying is, here's a dude that's got a needle in his neck, right? I don't have enough drugs. I'm going to fucking put it through my eyeball through here. He's got everything going. He's fucking... He's got all that grandiose, you know, machismo thing from the drugs, from his own personality. He's fucking young. He's an NCAA. Heavy. I mean, what the fuck? He's flying around on another planet, you know? And they're saying, hey, I can fucking use these things to smash people. Okay. Nobody wants to get in the ring with him. So if there's no Greg Ranger Stott, they didn't even have a fucking fight. So I don't know why they were telling me don't fight. Him. Like they were thinking of me. They're like, look, go in, kick somebody's ass, you know, in the thing. We'll build know. you up. We'll yeah. build you up. They're telling me that, you know, like, right, don't do it. I'm so fucking, well, of course, they got the right guy. You see what I'm saying now? Two, see, I'm going like this, two edge. So they got the right guy at the right time. I'm bipolar. They catch me on this side. Fuck, let's go for the world. I'm 34. You know, hey, let me see. He's the number one fighter in the world. I fight him. I beat him. What the fuck? Easy math. 
Yeah. Yeah. So I'm making, you see what true. I'm saying? So I, I go the fast track. And, and I mean, the point was, could there have been something there? I would have loved to have had something where I wasn't this, you know, fucking mush. But uh, but Ray Kerr was there. I mean, that was his time. I mean, you know what I'm saying? He, 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 whether he got, I mean, for me, I look at it more from a higher thing, not Mark, but really a higher. I mean, that, that was also how. Let's talk real quick, Miguel. You were there. Did yeah. you hear the fucking knee? Because all I heard from people after the knee was that they heard a cracking sound after he need me. Did you get to hear that or no? It was, look, the, the sound of it was pretty, I was acting on side and the sound made an impact. It, the, it, it made the, it, well, made John and everybody go like this. And of course, that's why he didn't jump down on my ass. I mean, they could have thought maybe something happened to me, you know, when it hit. Yeah. But the way I look at it is it really was a little bit of a, you know, I mean, I, I look at really, I took the whole thing, the whole incident, the whole shit thing. I've given you the roller coaster, right? Now I'm there. Flower yeah. child goes in ring, drug, mental, turns himself in, got money. I get knocked out like that. But guess what? I didn't get fucked up. I'm not Mark. I wouldn't want to be Mark after the fucking Peterson fight. What's that shit? He kicks fucking Peterson's ass for 15 minutes. He's on so much drugs, he can't lift his fucking arms. And in overtime, they say he can't lift his arms. And he comes up and fucking breaks his nose in one of the biggest leg kicks to the face knockouts in UFC history. Are you talking about Coleman? Coleman and Pete Williams. Yeah. 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 I thought his name was Peterson. Yeah. No. Was yeah, it Williams? Oh, it's Williams. Williams. Yeah, Pete, Pete, but he Pete, came Pete. out of Shamrock's camp. What I'm saying is, if I'm going to go for the knockout, guess what? I'm taking Kerr, hitting me, and it's almost like divine fuck. I'm out. You know, I didn't feel shit. It was like instant, you know, right in the button. <laughs> you know, what the frick? I went to what sleep. It hop. Yeah, it was over. I mean, and I've had shots like that that I've delivered. If you hit someone, I don't know where the exact spot is, but, you know, that's why they call it the button. You get hit in the button, it doesn't fucking matter. I mean, you're, you know, it's over. I mean, you know, there's no weight training. There's no, you know, it's over. I didn't have a glass jaw by any means because I really hadn't been knocked out that much. I had been beat down real bad before, but I hadn't really had that knockout thing. So it just hit. Boom. I get up. I'm like, holy fire. You know, you don't, you don't know nothing. You don't remember shit. It was really one of those, like, really, where are we? Or did we start to fight yet? You know what I mean? It's that kind of really gets you when you oh, well, that Greg, type of Greg, I, i've made decisions in life where i knew the possible outcome if it went bad yeah that it wouldn't be good for me but i never had it physically in front of me and then me choosing that which is what you did that day with mark kerr right <laughs> but I, i've done that a lot of times go in and have motherfuckers shooting at you from the ground in a helicopter you don't want to be there i mean anybody that said they were that's they're fucked up i mean i'm like what the fuck did i do that that was my whole ratio of thinking and you guys got to understand that who's out there listening because a lot of the people have never had any combat experience what i'm saying is everybody had the big prayers and the worry and the concern oh my god you're getting in with this guy and you're gonna fight and it's one person i'm like where the fuck were you when I'm going in and these assholes, I jump into fucking, you know, a country mm -hmm. and I'm not supposed to be there and fuckers are hunting me and they got fucking knives, guns, mines. They're fucking trying to kill me. Nobody's saying, oh, you poor, but, you know, they're like, oh, you know, they, and back then they didn't even know the words. Thanks for your service. You know, we're talking to you. Nobody gave a shit. And so nobody gives a shit. Nobody says a shit. But it's interesting, you know, that they didn't want to say anything about that the danger and what was going on, but yet to get in a ring with just one person, it's all like, Ooh, this is like, yeah. It is wild. So for it's me, what wild. I'm saying is it wasn't, that's what I'm trying to tell you. That's pretty I, wild. You got a man. different so, perspective. So what you're saying is correct. And, and you know, from our point of view, your point of view, when yes. you look at the people that are trolling, right. one, none of them have ever really been in a fight before. Well, that's what I'm saying, right. Let alone yeah. the number one fighter in the world. Wait, wait, let's just say again, this wasn't, let's go down to Johnny's gym and he knocked you out with a knee. This cat, first of all, the reason also, my my training partner was Will Lake, who's a great wrestler out of Raleigh. He's a fantastic coach. He's beautiful. But I could knock him out in a second. And the son of a bitch stood about 5'11". And he was a great grappler, national-type champion. All that's beautiful. And we rolled, and it was great. But the problem that I didn't do, you want to hear? I'm going to come up. Let me do a little confession. Here's the thing, especially in that day. You know, we didn't have camps. There was everyone was trying to figure out only a few people, right? They had the sunshine guys down there in Arizona working together. 
Maybe Randy was doing something in Oregon. Ken had the his. Sun kiss kids. Yeah, the Sun you know, kiss kids. Sun kiss. You know, whatever. These guys, they all got a little camp. I didn't have no camp. There was a cat named West. He was in Special Forces when I was down there and there. And uh, James. James West, like the fucking movie character. And, and Jimbo West, really renowned in Special Forces, got out. And he became a very successful coach. He actually got two guys out of Fayetteville into the UFC. But his his methodology was correct. Now, you got polar opposites. We're in the same town, same kind of county shit. His was, I got a school. These are my guys that are going to UFC. He used to tell everybody, hey, you want to learn something? Come to my school. He used them as cannon fodder. He let them beat the shit out of them. They never came back. Then his fighters were getting great training, and they did well in the UFC. What happened in my case is I got that freaking bullshit heart thing. I got it. I'm a teacher heart. You know, I like to. So you get with a guy, you can knock him out in a few seconds. And now you're his instructor, you're teaching. You're not doing what's right to get ready, let alone you're going to fight the freaking number one fighter in the world, not in the community. How far out from that event did you know your opponent was Mark Kerr? Right away. Because they, I, I mean, they, they didn't have me slotted. I mean, when they said the fight, there had to be the conversation of they had me as uh, a cho- well, they never had it out. They made it a choice. They said, we can put you on the alternate card and, you know, I think it'll be good for you. Uh, but then they said, uh, we got nobody to fight. I mean, they told me we got nobody to fight Mark Kerr. Well, so that's all you got at the event or over. No, the no, no. This is, and they're ready to do the marketing to figure who's fighting who this is long okay. before. Okay. Yeah. And they're like, literally, I'm hearing, like, nobody wants to fight Marker. <laughs> and I'm like, I'll fight Marker. You see what I'm saying? That's back to what I just talked about. And, and to me, I, it was like, connect the dots. Yeah, you from know? where you come from, it, it, it's obviously, you know, it's much less dangerous than what you were doing, which is live combat situations, right? So you probably avoided a little bit of, like, you know, like some of the other guys that had a bad moment in UFC, they felt like embarrassment, wanting to do it again, approve themselves. And you probably got over it really quick then. Is that is that a fair well, assumption? I don't know about – I mean, it sucked what happened. But the point is, you know what they say? Hey, Greg, don't worry. You'll come back. We'll give you 500 bucks. I'm like, how about fuck you? Yeah, yeah. 500 yeah. Bu- I mean, I already had a business. I mean, fucking punning money in the back. I mean, fuck you. I mean, you know what I mean? Now, let's just go – let's quote somebody that's worth quoting. You ready? Superfoot uh, Wallace, right? The Wallace. Right. You know what he said? I'm going to share it with your people. This is what he said. It's I, I've all these years. I mean, I, I said it fucking probably said it in the 80s, but I mean, I've quoted it forever. He says, there's only three reasons, three reasons, he said, why you should fight. Three. He said, to prove something to yourself, to prove something to yourself, to prove something to somebody else or for money. And if you're not fighting for one of those three, then don't be fighting. He's talking about professional. Right. Hello. Yeah. Wise, man. wise man. So when I took the fight, you follow what I'm saying. Why am I going to fight? Because I'm proving something to myself. The world. I have probably had, there wasn't money. I, money goes off the table because there was no money. You know what I'm saying? Unless you had no money. Say you were you know, from Mississippi, barefooted and in a shack. I guess it looks like money. But there was no money. So we take that off the table. And did I want to prove something to somebody else or to myself? Probably both, you know? So I took the fight. <laughs> but afterwards, and I'm dealing with this fucking Depico mental turn in, you know, I'm <laughs> fucked up. Who's showing up? You know, 500 bucks. How about fuck you? You know, no. <laughs> <laughs> well, you marketed yourself excellently. I mean, yeah, you really I'm did. a marketing guy. No, I mean, I went on Clearly. to do things that make that yeah. look like, you know, what the fuck? Like a walk in the, you know, the park. I mean, I, I, I closed the deal in New York City with one of the richest guys in the world. His name is um, Arnold uh, Gumowitz. And he hired me to come in and create a marketing plan that, I mean, they gave me a brand new Jaguar, freaking, you know, million dollar deal. I sold it to AT&T. So marketing has been my thing, my forte. My, I mean, so I get it. But uh, that was not a big challenge is what I'm saying. That was just who I was and part of the evolution of who I've become, you know, so marketing. That's fantastic. Yeah. But that, that was part of it. I mean, it's part of the journey. That's why we're talking you know? part mm-hmm. of my journey. And, you know, you guys have seen maybe on my site, that's the whole thing. I want to share that maybe at this time. It's a good segue was the, uh, the whole point about my outline, you know, for life and everything. It's all about what I put together. And did you read that on the site? You read the little quote? Yeah. 
It's fantastic. And then, yeah, and so when I say, I mean, it is. It just fucking fits. It's what's helped me because people are probably saying, well, Greg, you're all fucked up, but how come you're rich? How come you can do this shit now? And the whole point was I had the introspection. I called myself out. And then I developed the cognitive therapy because fuck those psychotropic drugs. I mean, I think if you're whacked and you can't get to the point where you're going to admit you got a problem, then take some drugs. You know, shut the hell up. Take some drugs. Chill out. You'll become introspective. The problem in the whole mental thing is that nobody has figured out what do we do with you? We can't just keep you on drugs for the rest of your life. Mm-hmm. Otherwise, we're doing what's called the Thorazine drip. They do that to the prisoners. Hey, how do we keep the prisoners? You know, you give them a little Thorazine. They got the drip coming. I'm like, uh, well, that's not human. Yeah, they keep them in jail. They keep them drugged. Sense. And that's what they do to everybody. And only they don't put them on Thorazine all the time. They just save that for your little day visits to the prison. They don't do the that so much anymore, but for a large period of time that they would Oh, it was terrible. Med- Everything. They would like over-medicate. Well, now they don't even need to. Now, and, and I mean, I'm not even giving – the worst one in which I stopped, and this was before my strong man appearance at the North Carolina Strongest Man, these geniuses, and I say that as with as much sarcasm as possible, these so-called experts, and I say that because they're not, that are mental midgets in the mental – profession said well we're going to give you fuck the depakote we're going to put you on a thing we found out could work or could neurontin have you guys heard of neurontin <laughs> well neurontin is what they give the they get that the freaking like people with back pain and you can't walk and ne- neurological problems but they said they found could be a benefit for the mentally ill bipolar so they give me this shit and this is what actually got me off drugs total. When I tell you the dosage, and I'm going on record right now telling you, ready? You got, they got to do the math. 6,400 milligrams a day. That's eight, 800 milligram tablets a day of Neurontin. Now, when we get done, do a little research. If you ever have a post on this, you'll say, they don't give that shit to elephants in that dose. So literally my wife came home one day after about less than a year on this stuff. And I'm sitting there doing the Thorazine drip. My central nervous system shut down. I had to go into a place and be detoxed off it. And that was the end of my uh, psychotropic journey on the numb nuts prescribing shit to me. And oh. that's where I got on my way to develop the cognitive therapy, which we were leading into, which is physical, financial, and spiritual. You work on three legs of life and in each leg of life, you start to do this outline. I have the books that are coming and all the resources at gregstott.com in which you can like learn about all this stuff. And it works. It doesn't matter whether you even, it actually works if you don't have a mental problem. It'll be, you know, a really good outline to work on life and balance. But it really has impact when you're challenged and you're being affected by the ups and the downs and the all arounds. And what it is, is the, the outline for each area of life, physical, financial, and spiritual goes like this. It's your vision is the journey. And vision is about learning to dream while you're awake. So your vision is the journey. Goals will be your roadmap to success. Discipline will be the vehicle. However, it must be tooled by focus and fueled with determination. You take that, I go over each part of that and you apply that into life and you'll have success physically, financially, and spiritually. Well, if I may double down on your theory of mental health experts, okay. go to any go to any major city and yep. look around outside. Look under yeah. the underpasses. There you go. I'm that's telling you, that's their work. You know, that, that's that their is, work, right? How successful the are they? Cornerstone of their success and ability to help manage people's lives, and, and also because with, yeah, beautiful. Right, because oh. they've done so well, all of us should listen to them for all of their opinions and values. Oh, we should. Amen. No and amen with a caveat. Sarcastic. If you can't find them under the overpass, look in the prison and the jails. See what I'm saying? Because again, that's the other filtering point for the ones that get lost, especially the males, because it's so easy to lock us well, up. Well, but Greg, I'm I'm in a I'm in a blue state. Yeah. We don't put them in jail anymore. They're all oh. under the over, underpass. Okay, so I think yeah, the yeah. majority will be there. Yeah, I agree. And I'm speaking more from my time frame where they just love, you know, like, hey, let's go. We got yeah. plenty of boxes. You got to go. This is one. Chicago. We, yeah. we got oh, a, you're right. They just let them go. Fantastic mayor. Yeah, yeah, I got Oh, shoot. Unbelievable. An even better governor. So, Greg, yeah, we're, we're since on the then, let, let's talk about some of your accomplishments since then before we wrap up. 
Yeah. You started doing strongman competitions too. Well, I did. Yeah. More than that. Yeah. I, and at age 40, I mean, what ended up happening was I did the powerlifting thing real big. 97 ends the fight deal. You know, when I, well, I mean, I ended it with fuck you, you know, I mean, yeah. <laughs> again, I went with Wallace. It's like, Hey, you want to maybe think to come back and fight? I'm like, well, I don't need to prove anything to anybody else. Nothing to myself. And you got no money. So <laughs> <laughs> that one's <laughs> We're done. So I switched gears. I've always been lifting and healthy, but now I'm going to go, you know, put the focus, right? And I define focus as a single-minded purpose to succeed. So all of a sudden I'm like, bam, using this laser focus and I start powerlifting. Let me just tell you, when you say, this is again, one of those lines, if I was doing a comedy show, when I say it's a pretty good record, you say, well, Greg, how good is it? The records that I set in North Carolina, right? 21 years ago in the open class are still the record. So, so people had 21 years to try to break it they haven't so what i'm saying is i put laser focus in i did right, my well, what, let's talk about the record what what yeah, yeah. competition what was what did you well, do it was, a, it was a world championship i've been part of and now i'm on the board and have evolved to be you know a very integral part in this whole raw movement have you if i say raw to you does that ring a bell in the lifting worldwide the word raw would be used raw well, I, I think it means like drug free and equipment free well, they've, they've polluted it, and now we'll take the drug thing out because it can go either way. But okay. raw, it would take the equipment out. You know what I'm saying? Raw, I mean, it doesn't specifically. I'd like it to be that in a perfect world, but it doesn't. Guys still got needles. You know, before they get on the platform, you got, hey, you got a needle here. Let me take it out. But the point is, is uh, raw means unequipped because the equipment thing and lifting was getting absurd. I mean, psycho city. They had at the Arnold, it was really a classic time. At the Arnold Classic, they invited 10 of the best benchers to come out when the bench shirts were getting, you know, single ply, double ply, triple ply, who the fuck knows ply. They're putting ply on, and these benchers come to do a big bench, right? And 10 of them get there, and guess what? Seven of them couldn't get a lift done, not because the weight was too heavy. They couldn't get the weight down to their chest. That's when the world woke up and said, I think we've gone a little too far with this equipment shit. You follow? So, equipment for, for is those... So so Those supportive. Home, they, they wear these shirts <laughs> yeah. that are interwoven. Oh. And it forces Kevlar. their shoulders to almost like to be their pecs. Well, it pulls yeah, it I forward. Mean, well, you're describing a cosmetic effect of this contortion, but let's just stay on the shirt. The shirt at this time where we're talking was like its own entity, meaning it stood up on its own. Meaning you could say shirt, you could talk to the son of a bitch. You had to get it. You had to have five people put it on. It you had at least three people to put it on. Right. Yeah. I mean, we, we just want to get into some sci-fi shit with bionics and shit. Like, who's lifting? I don't know. The shirt or you. And what I'm saying is this shirt decided, because it was so incredible, that when the guys would unrack, like, say, 700 pounds, right, it's not enough weight to touch their chest. You have to bring the weight down to your chest to get a command to press. I'm not saying that it crashed in on them or they couldn't get it off their chest. We're saying we got to a point of being so fucked up, we couldn't get it down to the chest. So, <laughs> I, was part, okay. so I was part of the raw movement. I had always been preaching it. I believed in it because, again, I'm old school. I started lifting in the 70s, you know, the whole deal. So, I mean, I'm not taking the drug. I've already made the commitment. I'm not wearing equipment. I'm a T-shirt guy. Let's see how much we can lift, you know, and do it. So that was the point. So I was part of the raw movement. Uh, the, the Federation's called 100% Raw. Right now, it's run by a very good friend of mine. He's the president for the last 20 years. His name's Paul Bossy, fantastic guy. And uh, I'm on the board. And um, yeah. So anyway, it was one of their national championships in, um, well, we're going 21 years ago. I guess you want to say it was like uh, 2000. Yeah. Two, actually, the, the one that was the record that's still on the books was in 2001. And what and, was it? What did you lift? Yeah, yeah. I did a 450, 450 raw bench. I did a 650 squat. And I did a 770 deadlift. Jesus Christ. I didn't even wear a belt. I mean, I was wow. about raw. I didn't come out with a fig leaf, but I was about on that mode. You know what I'm saying? I mean, <laughs> we're talking t-shirt. <laughs> we're talking t-shirt and a singlet. You know what I mean? About as raw as you're going to get. So, wow. so what I'm saying is guys have had a long time to break the record. They haven't. It still stands. And then uh, I really kind of 
you know, where people, you know, I always hate this. I love in interviews to say, you ever hear people say they don't regret shit? If you don't regret shit, you haven't done shit. So sure. what I'm saying, you know what I mean? Like, I, you know, to all you guys that say you don't regret shit, fuck you. Because <laughs> you should regret. You should really right. put yourself out there where when you look back, there's something to say, damn, I wish I did it different, you know? Because hindsight's 2020. So the point is, is in the powerlifting, I really was built for it. It was great. I wish I had put more focus on it with what I was doing. But as everything in my life from I'm in, I'm there, I'm there, I move. And it could be a little overflow with a bipolar deal. I said, well, shit, I'm already here doing this. I got to go to Strongman. <laughs> so, I mean, I jumped ship and all of a sudden I'm Mr. Strongman. So, yeah. And I did some really neat stuff. Yeah, I mean, in 2004, I became the fifth man in the world to lift over 1,000 pounds, 1,045 pounds deadlift. So, and, know, I, and there's a documentary coming out about your life. Am I correct? Well, we put that on hold because of all this movie shit, you know. And what you're going to now see is segments that were shot from it that we'll do through the podcast and stuff that's coming up. So if we got to have a peck in order and anybody's watching and wants to know what's going on, it's real simple. Go to gregstott.com. Just spell my name right. It's not Scott. It's Stott. S-T-O-T-T, gregstott.com. You go there. You subscribe for free. Everything's free. I mean, I'm toting the bill. You get a free newsletter. It's called PFS for Life. That's what I close each meeting whenever I talk. I wish everybody PFS for Life because that's what, you know, you really need to have more balance in your life, physical, financial, and spiritual development. Anyway, you go there, get the newsletter. It's free. It comes to you. It'll give you all the updates and what's happening and what's not. We got shows that are coming out, all the special guests. I've got a custom gym being put together. It's going to be one of the best gyms in the world for strength sports. I'm going to be flying in the strongest men and women. The show's called Strength Quest. It's going to be awesome. They're going to spend the weekend with me. We're going to talk all about life, physical, financial, spiritual. We're going to work out together. Hell, I'm older than most of these guys' dads. And we're going to train. They're going to be in this great facility. I've got everything set up to show everything. I've got a music studio. Did you guys know I played the piano? What's your deal? Did you find that out? I found that, but I didn't find any video on it. I know. I pulled it down. I got all this shit. When you hear it, you'll be pretty. I think it's pretty cool. I got a thing coming out called Piano Compliments. It's not just about accompanying the singer. It's all about complimenting the song. Has your favorite song been complimented yet? Find out at gregstott.com. <laughs> and I'm going to go in there and rewrite this shit. I mean, when you hear me play, I do everything from rap to country to classical. It'll be great. So I built a whole music studio on this compound. <laughs> so this is the fun part when you make it you're freaking 60 you got the shit you can do it i've got all the buildings i got my own video and recording studio being done it'll be open in november i've got the studio for the gym to fly them in for the show we're gonna have the podcast going greg stop live we're going to talk about all this crap and stuff and life and answer some questions and do these things and then um we'll see what happens with the hollywood thing with the movie stuff my writer compadre is named dan gordon he's a super guy very accomplished uh he's got over 17 movies he's written uh some of them you might know the hurricane uh kevin costner's robin hood you know hurricane with uh denzel right. washington yeah yeah he wrote all those yeah yeah he's a really talented guy we hit it off he's uh he's uh got dual citizenship in israel israel in here He's in his 70s, uh, just a fantastic guy. We met at a lifting competition. He's still lifting. I was judging, and we hit it off. And uh, he's the one that's helping me to put all the stuff together, you know, like the life story. We had to switch the name of the life story because we couldn't get friggin' uh, releases from all the people that were affected by all my bullshit. <laughs> so we changed it. So we, ch so we changed the title. So the series, I don't think they're going to do movie because it's just too much shit. They're going to do like in a TV series type thing so you can have episodes, you know, episodal and kind of put it out. It's going to be called The Garino because that's what they used to call me, The Garino. And the subtitles, what makes it The Garino, Man, Villain, Angel, Beast, based on a true story. That's awesome. Cool. Greg Stott, absolute pleasure talking to you. Your contributions, although not very large in the sport of mixed martial arts, they were indelible, and people will always remember you. And we sincerely appreciate it. Wow. Really appreciate the time, guys. I really appreciate sharing the memories. And, uh, like, again, anybody out there that's watching this, visit me at gregstott.com and find out what's up. Yeah, awesome. no, I, Thank I, you, sir. Definitely I encourage people to visit Greg Stott. You know, as historians in the combat sports, you know, me and Mike, we, we 
sometimes, you know, a guy like Greg, where we're not sure how his story ended, I get worried about, like, you know, that, that bo- the, the boxing tragic figures and stuff like that. And, Greg, you're exactly the opposite. You're an inspiration, so I'm very grateful to have met you, man. Thank you. Yeah, appreciate sure. the kind words, guys. Take Be care. Good, brother. Check out the full interview on iTunes, Spotify, and all major podcast platforms.